Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Google Play, and a whole bunch of other venues. Just visit our sites, chimeraobscura.com slash vm or vmspod.com to find more information, along with our RSS feed. And follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod. Well, I... um. I made it down to D.C. for a congressional briefing last week, which I, I alluded to, I'm pretty sure, in, in the last intro. Uh, it went fine, although um, it was one of those days where I had to get up at 4 a.m., hit the road at 5 a.m., catch the 615 Acela from Newark um, down to Washington, and then reverse the whole trip in the afternoon. Um, on the trip down, I was accompanied by one of my work pals. He gets on in, in Trenton. Uh, work pal is just, we met through work. He's actually, um, well, he's a book guy and, and we've become really good friends and, and we spend lots of time gabbing about non-pharmaceutical stuff. But, uh, but anyway, it's just a wrong term to use. Whatever. What we did was, you know, in the, the train trip down, we talked about how we used to make this trip every week or two for 10 months straight back in 2015 and 2016, like same wake up time. I mean, I was getting up at four o'clock in the morning. Each of these times he would get on the Northeast regional and in, in uh, Trenton. And, and we would do this um, for, for 10 months straight back when we were doing this big negotiation with FDA. And this time we're sitting on the train, just totally zonked asking each other, like, how did we do this for that, that whole Gadufa negotiation? Did we get that old since then? The answer is yes, we did get that old since then. We both passed 50 during that time. Pandemic kind of slowed us down a lot too, but uh, it was weird just getting back into that, that you know, mode of, of wake up first thing in the morning, early in the morning, and, and, you know, get rolling to go be Mr. Wonderful down in Washington. But the briefing went well. Like I said, uh, congressional staffers had some good questions for our panel, and my members who comprised the panel were were happy with the whole experience. Um, and in most of the pictures that uh, people took, we had a, a photographer who was a government affairs person for one of the other member companies, and she took a bunch of shots, and one of our panelists did too. Um, the upshot was, uh, in the pictures of me standing at the podium uh, talking, I did not look like a raging madman, which is a real win because... It's just something about my delivery. If you try and capture it in, in photos, I just look like I'm shouting at people. So it was nice not to look shouty. Anyway, that was uh, most of the, well, that was the big thing from last week. There's lots of little stuff I could get into, but um, we're not going to do that. But speaking of 2015, getting into that Wayback Machine, uh, my guest this week, Christopher Ballin, was last on the show that year, uh, we talked at that point about his first crime novel, Orient. It was a second novel overall. And now he's back with a brand new book, The Lost Americans from Harper. There, there were two more books in between then and now, which we'll get into in the, the conversation. The Lost Americans is a blast. It is, well, I could get into a whole description of the, the story of, of the, the, the mystery thriller crime aspect of it it is a lot easier just to go with uh, the publisher's blurb here so i'm going to read that when the lifeless body of eric castle a weapons technician for a major american defense contractor is found under his hotel balcony both his employer and the egyptian authorities quickly declare his death a suicide but the dead man's sister kate doesn't believe eric took his own life and is determined to get to the truth Traveling to Egypt, she begins to piece together her brother's life in Cairo with the help of a handsome, young, gay Egyptian man named Omar, who yearns to escape the brutality of his nation's harsh, restrictive government. There's another paragraph or two, but that pretty much nails it. So, international mystery thriller crime novel, great setting in Cairo and environs and a couple of U.S. settings that, that play a key role in the, the book. Um, astute social and political observations, a lot of neat stuff on the ugliness of the, the global arms trade and, and sort of what it's like, uh, a sense of what it means to be queer in a repressive society. And overall, the fantastic dialogue that, for me, always sets Christopher's fiction apart from, well, apart from other crime writers I've read and a lot of other writers I've read, too. 
um, as we talk about in the conversation here, it's sometimes just the domestic, almost extraneous talk and dialogue that really draws the reader into the story and not just the, uh, the clues, you know, the things that have to be there for the sake of the, the mystery, but the things that, that help embellish and let us better understand the, the characters. And uh, Chris is uh, Christopher is just amazing at what gets said and, and what gets left unsaid. So I really enjoyed the heck out of the Lost Americans. I fully submitted to the twists and turns of the mystery. I felt deeply for Kate as she's trying to understand what happened to her brother, why it happened, um, what the red herrings are over the course of the plot, her own bad life decisions that sort of lead her into this this whole world. And and I just reveled in, in his affection that Christopher shows for, for his flawed lead characters, as well as the, uh, the, the sort of minor figures throughout. So The Lost Americans is a joy to read. And to be honest, I was awfully glad to get Christopher back on the show just so we could, getting back at 2015, talk about our respective midlives and, and how they have changed from then. He j was just on the cusp of 40 back then. And also get an idea about the evolution of his fiction. Uh, and and well, also just to talk about what we've taken from all the, the writers and artists we've interviewed over the years. I also want to note that despite the fact that we haven't spoken since 2015, we have emailed a couple of times and he's the guy who connected me with Peter Sheldahl ultimately, which is one of my all time favorite podcasts. But even though we haven't talked in all those years, even before we started recording, it was like picking up exactly where we left off. Like he's just such an effusive personality and we had such a quick connection. It was like the way you would talk with an old friend. And um, well, that's kind of awesome. Anyway, rather than blather on any more about how much I enjoyed The Lost Americans and this conversation, let's just dive into it. Here's Christopher's bio. There's a more extensive one on his website. Christopher Ballin is the author of the critically acclaimed novels A Beautiful Crime, the Destroyers, Orient, and Lightning People. He is a frequent contributor to a number of publications, including Vanity Fair, The New York Times, and Interview. He lives in New York City. His new book is The Lost Americans. And now, the 2023 Virtual Memories Conversation with Christopher Ballin. Tell me about the Lost Americans' origins. Where'd this novel start for you? And I do want to preface, even though I'm going to eat up all the, the intro time, by saying I have not read your two previous novels because I still haven't forgiven you for the, the character you killed off in, in Orient uh, three novels ago. But I, I do have both of them on my shelf. The Destroyers and uh, uh, A Beautiful Crime are both on my shelf right here. So I, I promise I will go back and, and start. But tell me about TLA. Well, Where did the, the Lost yeah. Americans start? Well, actually, that's a, a very good seg because I feel like every novel, and to a certain extent, is a reaction to the last novel I wrote. Um, and it, one because I feel like I'm bored of the world and I want to do I want to do a different world than, than the one that I just painted. But also because, um, you know, I feel like there's just so much to tackle that I that I didn't get to in the in the last books. And I feel like with destroyers and uh, a beautiful crime. They were both, uh, they're both very different, but both were sort of involved with, um, art and luxury and these sort of worlds of, uh, of cafe society and rich people. And, um, and sort of the one was set in Greece and one was set in Venice. And, um, and, you know, I just, I felt like I needed to do a very different kind of novel because <clears throat> I mean, I love those worlds and I love the art world and I love, the idea of these like glamorous places, but I also wanted to dive into, you know, real politics. And I had always loved Egypt. I mean, Egypt is a country that I loved as a child. I was obsessed with uh, ancient Egypt. I would have, you know, all these books about ancient Egypt. And uh, as an adult, um, I got to travel to, finally got to travel to Egypt. And that just sort of spirited me away on, on modern Egypt and contemporary Egypt. And so I've always wanted to set a book there. And um, when 
Uh, a Beautiful Crime was published in 2020. In January 2020, I had a trip planned. I was going to go to Cairo and do all this research and build this book that I wanted to write. And of course, as we know, um, the pandemic happened. Yeah. So um, I ended up, you know, holed up in this little cabin I had in the Berkshires. And I was like, well, I can't write about Cairo because I'm not one of those writers that likes to pretend they've been somewhere just by watching YouTube videos. You know, <laughs> there are those writers that can sort yeah, of like yeah. glean the world by YouTube video. But I really like to explore the place and get to, and to know it as, as well as possible. But, you know, I just decided the world was ending. I'm just going to write the book anyway. And so I had been to I had been to Cairo, but I had been to Cairo before the, uh, the Arab Spring. So I had been in 2010 was the last time. Um, which was when Mubarak was still in power. And so I wrote it. Um, I, I, you know, dove into the politics of it and um, the international arms sales. And because I knew that um, I wanted Omar to be a gay character, who's sort of one of the two protagonists, I knew I couldn't, you couldn't write a gay character, a gay young man in contemporary Egypt without uh, having to address the current politics and, you know, the repression of basic rights for gay people. So it, be it became a much more political um, uh, novel than it would have been otherwise if I had said it somewhere else. And so and then and, and just to, to make a, a long story, a little less short, I once I wrote it, it as soon as uh, I was uh, double uh, <clears throat> injected, I was able to go in April 2021 and I flew right to Cairo and I got to walk in the character's footsteps and uh, make sure that the world that I had created was still accurate. And so I got to, you know, fix the novel a little bit based on based on that. So, um, yeah, but that's yeah, how that's much fun. more did that did that add? Because the setting, it, it feels so real. I mean, sensorily, it, it feels very real what's there and, and how much of the how much of the book, I guess, was added after the the trip, or was it simply just kind of fleshing not, out some of what the uh, believe it or not, not much. Like. It was it was pretty mm -hmm. much the same. I mean, it was still the same city and still the same beautiful, chaotic, loud, so many worlds within a within a single block that it's always been. Um, so it didn't really change that much. Of course, like when I went, I, I saw details and you know, certain images that I wanted to insert. And in fact, it was actually a struggle not to change it more because I'd already written so much of it and you can <laughs> just sort of keep over baking something until, you know, uh, so, but it, yeah, it was really helpful to go back and, um, I love, I love it there. I hope I'm allowed back. I mean, I might, I might, not, I might be banned from the country <laughs> after this book, but, um, I, but I, you know, it's, it's a place that I, I really care about. Um, and uh, I hope I did it justice. And did the the Egypt, well, I'll say Egypt fetish, but you, it's shorthand for us, uh, right. really begin for you with the the, the whole seventies Tutankhamen exhibition and the, the the way Egypt sort of swept you, through America back in the seventies and eighties? I'm the 70s so glad 80s? you know about that. And you, it's that's of course I wasn't aware of that, but that must have been why, because as you're you're referring to this big show. At the Met, right? Was it the Met? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. With uh, Tutankhamun that came in the 1970s. And it was like a like the 1920s all over again. This like worldwide obsession uh, with Egypt. And um, and for a while, I, I got a poster from that for that uh, from that exhibition and hung it in in the Berkshires. Um, but, you know, I think so, because also one of the things that I loved so much was the Agatha Christie's Death on the Nile, which I had a, a poster of in my bedroom. And that poster of Death on the Nile, the movie, um, was also inspired by that show, by that exhibition. Mm -hmm. And so I think it was like Egypt mania, uh, ancient Egypt mania. At that I, time. I should ask, did you watch the, the, the Ken Branagh remake of Death on the Nile? Oh my God! I <laughs> I refuse to forever. I refuse to watch the. I still haven't watched the Murder on the Orient Express one, and I'm a huge, huge fan of the the 1970s Murder on the Orient Express and uh, Death on the Nile. Yeah. And I did watch on a flight the uh, Death on the Nile one, and I was 
so angry at it. I hated it. It was terrible. <laughs> it was horrible. The um, real anti mustache guy is that? It? <laughs> I am so anti. Actually, I mean, he's actually. I mean, he's not my Poirot, but it, I just thought the the story, the way they changed the storyline and played with it, and it was just it was so cheesy. I mean, they. I think they actually filmed in Egypt, if I'm not mistaken, and they it still looked like a Hollywood stage set. Like, how do you how do you film yeah, on location it, so. <laughs> and like you still make it look like it's all like wax and like it looks totally fake? If the world is a green screen, although yeah. it is a question I had when I, I finished the book, it felt it, not in a cheap way, but it, it felt uh, the lost Americans like it could be such a movie. And I, mm. I don't know, I try early, but is that the sort of thing? Have you had interest nibbles, et cetera? Uh, yeah, I've had whole bites. I've up? had whole crocodile okay. bites. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, there are no crocodiles in the Nile that uh, above Aswan anymore because of the dam. Yeah. I mean, above actually, uh, uh, you know, right over Sudan because of the dam. But um, I uh, so that that analogy doesn't fully work with the Nile. But uh, yes, I, I have. An, you know, I always write um, cinematically. I think it's because of the way I yeah. grew up watching uh, unlimited HBO <laughs> from from second grade <laughs> onward. Um, so I feel like it just has, and I wonder sometimes how, you know, this generation coming up watching TikTok will change the novel because of, you know, watching that form. I mean, maybe they'll de destroy the novel, but, um, I think I can only I hope. I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's <laughs> probably doing a good job on its own, but, um, actually, you know, funnily enough, I don't know if you caught this, um, I tried, I mean, the, the, one of the big themes of The Lost American is sound. So Omar has uh, a hearing impairment. Um, one of the main clues is a recording of a, of a voice. There's always like mm -hmm. the sounds of the weapons um, because it's, a, you know, he's a weapons tech. Um, Kate, who's the, who's the other pregnant, the, the other protagonist, she was dating a musician. So I was actually trying to like make it less visual and more audio. Um, but, mm -hmm. uh, you, but, you know, Cairo is such a beautiful city and it's, uh, it, it's pretty hard to not just revel in, in the visuals of it. Um, and you know, there's four mm -hmm. locations really, they sort of mirror each other. There's New York city city. And then there's, um, the Berkshires country. And then there's Cairo city. And then there's Siwa, which is out in the, uh, uh, the desert and that sort of country. Um, so there's these four different places, these four different, uh, locales, all very different, wildly different, um, that I got to play with. So I do think that it would look, it would look great as a film, but you know, everything's a limited series or, now. Yeah. I was just about to say, or series on Hulu, but yeah. That's, yeah, uh... exactly. No one dreams of movies anymore. I think I'm the only person who who would love to see a, something to be made into a film. But um, but yeah, I, I mean, I, I love that idea. I, you know, I used to resist it. I thought you were supposed to resist it as a serious author, but I think anything that keeps the story going is is really healthy. Yeah, I, I did a show a few weeks ago with Matt Ruff, the guy who did the the novel Lovecraft Country, which got adapted into a, an HBO oh, yeah. series. It was very different than the the novel that he wrote, and he was just, it was great. Uh, he wasn't involved in the writing or or anything with the series. I called him in, and, you know, to consult a few times, but he said that just the idea that they took what I had and and found other permutations of it and kept this story going that it resonated enough. I said I, I'm honored and happy and i hope there are other you know ways of of you know sort of adapting that work going forward he had just written the sequel himself well um, i think in a way yeah, he's it's, smart it's, not yeah. to involve himself because then it it's not like i think then it's sort of like that was the definitive version of his book but as right. long as he kind of kept himself apart then there could be multiple versions and and you know off the original so i always think it's smart to just yeah. sort of like let it go um, that said, I would love to. Do you, write do you see all of your books fitting into a? Do, do, do your books fit into a, a, a an overall, you know, Balin verse, you know, or, oh, or do you have characters so. retouching and overlapping? Okay. Well, I've never had. I've never you. I would love to do that. I've. I think actually, if you write enough books, um, 
maybe you do understand like why you would like to do a sequel to one. I would I, I would have said two books ago that I would never do a sequel, but I can kind of get the appeal of it. Um, unfortunately, I have to tell you that I went to a tarot card reader uh, when I was in Newport last summer. I was writing mm -hmm. an article for uh, Condé Nast um, Traveler. I don't know why they picked me. I don't know anything about Newport, but I went and it was it was wonderful. But I, I ended up... Uh, so there was this famous Newport tarot card reader who told me that I would only write nine books and then I would start my 10th book, <laughs> <laughs> that I would start my 10th book with something would happen and I wouldn't finish it. And so now I've written, I'm on my seventh book, believe it or not, that I'm writing right now. So I really only have two more books after this one. <laughs> and then well, I'm done. Tarantino said he was only going to do 10. You Maybe you can get away with a novel in the form of short stories. Maybe that'll cheat the, the, the tarot oh, gods or something. Do you think that's, <laughs> you yeah, do you think maybe, she, maybe that's what she was saying? I would start writing like short story collections. I don't know. Yeah, see, they, they'll really count as books, especially on the sales side. But, you know, that, that way you can still maybe try and get away with a keep well, the frankly, career I going and your life. A lot. But, uh, <laughs> I thought, like, oh, yeah. Jesus, I have to write two more. Um, like, I got to ask, I mean, you were just, we, we spoke in 2015 where you had finished your second, you published your second novel, Orient. Yeah. And, and you've written, you've written three more, si well, you've published three more since. Right. Uh, right. right. You know, it's basically four crime novels plus your first novel, which I've never read and which you've sort of talked about in interviews as as not being the novel it should have been, uh, as opposed to five different novels it could have been at the same time. I, that's true. But, <laughs> <laughs> no, which is me speaking in this convoluted shorthand of mine. But but with four crime novels under your belt, whether they're whodunits or or other crime fiction. What's gotten easier and, and what's gotten more challenging when it um, comes to the, the writing? Right. What? Well, you know, I sometimes wonder if I keep telling myself the next book, I'm going to do it. I'm going to make an outline and I'm going to figure out the mystery uh, or the, the murder, or the crime or the whodunitness of it, uh, the plot, basically before I get past chapter one, because I feel like this I, I feel like I keep painting myself into corners and one day I'm going to get stuck in it and not be able to weasel my way out as a writer. And then I start to sit down and write a new book. And I, and I think oh, tomorrow I'll do the outline. I'm just sort of playing around with the character. And then suddenly I'm like six chapters in, I have like a full thing going. <laughs> I've killed someone like, you know, it's moving along and I still have no idea where it's going. And so I think maybe I trust that process is as difficult and cumbersome as it is. Um, I would love, though, I mean, I actually, as I, as the more books I write, I mean, I haven't written that many books, but um, I admire the shorter books. And so I keep wanting to make the books a little slimmer each time. Uh, and and mm -hmm. just because I love a shorter book. I think the discipline of it is so nice. And I was actually in uh, Paris. I, I did this writing residency in Paris uh, last year, and I was outside Shakespeare and Company, and they had on the reduced sales rack, <laughs> uh, you know, they have like an outside <laughs> reduced sales rack, uh, and you know, with good company. So I'm in, in, I'm not uh, ashamed. There was Orient, which is the book you interviewed me for, and I picked it up, it's half price. And it was like the size of a Bible. <laughs> like, I can't believe we talked that about that to... when I was listening back to our podcast. It was six hundred pages. Yeah, like I, I don't remember it being six hundred pages, but I yeah, picked it up and I was like, I can't believe I was you. allowed to publish this book. It's so big, <laughs> it's huge. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I'm glad I got away with it and got to do it. But it, it, it I definitely would love to to lean toward uh, slimmer, slimmer novels. Are there writing influences? I mean, you, you mentioned, well, you have Graham Greene as, as one of the first quotes to begin the book, and I, I yes. significantly get that in, in this one, uh, more in the entertainments of, of Graham Greene, which is not a, a knock. It's just his own terminology. Yeah. Uh, those well, novels the versus the quote unquote. Yeah. Yeah. The the serious literature is fine, but, you know, I, I think his his milieu was really those uh well, again entertaining novels but were there other or are there other sort of literary influences you look at now who maybe well, weren't as important to you when you were younger and, and developing that you now look at as 
you know, again, how to streamline or how to how to write what you really want to get across? That's a great question. And I think for this novel, um, Robert Stone was actually mm. quite influential. And I did I, I did read um, Outer Bridge Reach, um, which is not a, about it's about a, it's sort of about sailing. That's one of his, his novel about sailing. But um, I thought a lot about Flag uh, for Sunrise and um some of it damascus gate and some of his more political novels i didn't reread them but i thought about them um and just like i love his the complication of his characters i mean they're so complicated and they're so they're like they're not it's not about likable or unlikable they're just they're so so multifaceted that you you don't come up with a sort of conclusion about them and i loved that i love the flaws of his characters. And, um, and so he, you know, he reared his head for this book, I think more than like, um, uh, Agatha Christie or, uh, you know, Patricia Highsmith or any of those Graham Greene. Yes, always. Um, but I would say this is much more, are, did, are, do you know Robert Stone's books? Never read him because I'm I'm well. We all have our horrendous lacunae. I've probably got three or four of his books on my shelf from the oh yeah oh, I should read do? this guy and because yeah, I think he's kind you know. of been forgotten in in a lot of ways. I think mm. he's forgotten kind of before he died even. But um, he's yeah. he was such a great writer. Um, yeah, that's a that's a whole other area we can go into the sort of writers who have we'll just say become passe who somehow mm -hmm. have fallen off the radar even though. They meant a lot, and there's various um, cultural slash cancellation reasons for that sometimes. But right. you know, in other instances, it's just yeah, people don't seem to be interested in reading somewhat difficult but really good books. So you know, we can go on about those goddamn kids, and that that could be a later part of the conversation <laughs> if you want. Uh, I have but, a uh, lot to think. I, yeah, I think been about that a lot. Um, yeah, I think about because like, I feel like uh, you know, in the art world. There's uh, R Roberta Smith had that great uh, quote about like no artist left behind. Like every artist mm -hmm. eventually gets rediscovered and like has an, a, another moment and becomes like, you know, written into the canon. And it's true. I mean, you, you know, everyone's like digging through the 70s and 80s looking for those those artists that haven't been uh, acclaimed or brought back uh, for, for, for this generation. But I don't know if that's true for writers. Um, I'm sure so many that we don't, you know, I don't even know about that I would love um, have just completely disappeared and there will be no sure, no reclamation. For yeah. Them. I mean, we see the New York Review books guys are always, you know, trying to rechampion yes. people who were, you know, lost. But but yeah, between that and the fading reputation of, of you know, cis white men. Um, a number right. of well, you know, I was watching the uh, uh, American Masters documentary on Saul Bellow, and you know, as much high praise as there was, I thought <laughs> nobody's reading Saul Bellow. <laughs> you know, no. It's just yeah. So that's but, a. You know, uh, I was I um, recently reread a lot of Roth, and I yeah was, I, I noticed that on on Instagram. And I was going to mention him next as as one of those. Oh figures. my God! Tell me about that. I, I had um, it started. Well, I had I'd gone through a raw stage about I don't know twenty years ago, you know, and I had read some of the big ones and I loved it. But then mm -hmm. I was like, this is too. It was like too good, too cynical, too mean and for for me mm -hmm. at that age. I loved it. I really loved it, and I yeah. thought it was brilliant. And then I just stopped reading him and went on, you know, in another course. And now I'm, you know, 20 years older than that uh, young man. And <clears throat> I quite literally, Sabbath Theater, I was moving into this apartment and Sabbath Theater fell on me. And because uh, I still had all these Roth books that I hadn't read. And uh, I was like, I, you know, I never, I never read this one, and everyone always talks <laughs> about it. And I, yeah. I mean, I loved it. It was one of those books that I could not stop talking about, like to anyone who would listen to me. Which is like, I love when you're like, speak just becomes like, so obsessed with a book that you can't let it go. And, yeah. <laughs> and then that was one of them. And it was, it's so wicked, and yet it is so devastating. Yeah. Uh, and so I was just like. Uh, what a master. I love, I love oh. Roth. I'm, I'm, and so in a way I'm it's so exciting yeah. not to read all those books, 
you know, in your twenties and early thirties and discover some of them, hold, hold some of them back to discover them later. Um, sure. Yeah. There, there's a whole school of, of, of it's, it was the original goal for the podcast. I wanted to do 10 years ago, books that you read when you were younger, completely didn't get not necessarily something from like high school, but right. just what you weren't ready for that you came back around to 20 years later and thought, Oh yeah, no, I was a moron. Okay, that that's actually great. Or just things you discovered at the right time in life. Um, I mean, there, there again, are books like that I loved when I was eighteen, like The Bell Jar or something, which was which I loved, and probably still love. But I probably wouldn't hit me the same way, or to, you know, to such a degree. You you have to be sort of eighteen to to get that yeah. book. And there were other ones I tried desperately i remember i was eight, also 18 and i really wanted to love dh lawrence like i wanted to be a dh lawrence not scholar but sort of a an acolyte and uh i have to say it was to tell you the truth i read all those books but i was too young for them i didn't quite understand what was going on the whole time yeah i powered through them but i don't think that i got them yeah, you you turned all the pages correctly, right? Which is a, which is more than most people were doing at that age. You know, I was that was like purely sure. just like out of a you know I picked it out of a, I think because he was bisexual or there was something bisexual about his books or something that excited yeah. me. You know, and it's some stuff. You know, it, you, it made well. It was hugely significant at its moment in history that we've so integrated that it's tough to see oh i guess this was good back then or this was necessary back then i mean i'll still fall back on on tropic of cancer because i'm weird like that but um you love tropic just, of just, cancer yeah and orwell's essay on it there the, this gestalt between those two or conversation between those two that have sort of shaped all of my literary thinking for the last 30 plus years, which is kind of a weird thing to admit to myself in the moment. But um, <laughs> that, that's where we are. That's uh, it, it's I an haven't essay called, read that uh, book since I was probably 19. Yeah, it's it's something. I mean, it's read it, read Inside the Whale, the essay by by Orwell, ostensibly about Tropic of Cancer and um, the interplay between them makes for a very interesting literary and historical moment in which they were taking place. Um, but that's, oh, that that's, sounds yeah. fascinating. I would love to, I tried to, you know, uh, speaking of him, I, I tried to read Burmese days just recently and I couldn't, I couldn't, his novels weren't really that good. I couldn't get into it. You know? Yeah. His, his essays to me are, are where Orwell really shined. Um, but I've, I've got weird history of listening to Orwell essays on tape, driving back and forth from like uh, college and home and grad school. And so, Oh wow! Is that a good this. way to digest it? They were, yeah. I'll I'll send you the name. I forget the the name of the reader. I think it's David Wood or something Wood, a uh, British guy. And and I I think my brother ended up digitizing all of the audio cassettes that we listened to compulsively. Um, so you get things like England, Your England, and uh, uh, Inside right. the Whale, and a few of the other majors. Oh my gosh! Send that um, to me because I have changed since we've last spoken i have changed my uh belief on audiobooks entirely based solely yeah. on the fact that i was you know i had in from 2015 until last year i had that cabin in the berkshires and uh all that driving i did back and forth from the city it was a, it was wonderful to have audiobooks you weren't listening to my podcast the whole time i'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> well you know what i was doing though is i was listening to um nonfiction. And yeah. uh, and saving fiction, you know, to read in. in, in yeah, I wonder how that works. I've never done audio books at all, but I wonder if fiction, if you retain what you need to retain from a, a, a piece of fiction by audio. But, yeah, I mean, I think probably like more like, you know, fun reads you can get by audio. Yeah. But I think sometimes, you know, you want the sentences, you want to sort of cherish the sentences of the. Do you read your stuff aloud? No. Oh, in my head, I mean, yes. not not in, yes, not in public yes. readings, but do you like when well, you're writing? Do you actually? Well, just you know. as like a side on that is like I I feel terrible because actually my first book I loved like writing lightning people and I haven't read it since the day it was published. I mean, even I mean I did read. A I don't page. listen to my own show, so it's okay. Go. So I feel like I'm like always bullying that poor book, but but maybe I would open it one day and be delighted by it. So who knows? Um, hmm. It's just like an easy target. But uh, I, I do read it. Yeah. I mean, sound is really 
important, the sound of the sentences is, is key to me. And so I do read it aloud. I read it in my head. Yeah. I don't really like, you know, read it out loud, but I, I read it, you know, in my head. Yeah, some people do literally, you know, just pick it up and, and read it out loud after they're, they're done so they can hear it, you know, bouncing off the walls as opposed to, you know, the yeah. insides of our brains. But yeah, I think I mean, your prose works really too. Oh, definitely. I was just going to say with your, your prose, it's, it's the dialogue as, as we talked about with Orient. And I'm glad to see, you know, if, if anything, your dialogue just gets sharper and sharper. Uh, I'll go back and check those intervening two novels and make sure. <laughs> um, but also the sense of, just relationship and family and what what gets exposed through dialogue what what gets said without being said uh i, th I think you're absolutely masterful with Aww. with this book and and the again going back to orient you know this you you understand what the characters are saying and what they're not saying to each other um not just in the mystery of what's going on but in who they are and how they relate to one another um it it just well, it, it felt really good, you know, reading that sort of thing. And I, I, as we talked about eight years ago, you know, a chunk of that seemed from your side to, to come from all the, the interviews you've done over the years. Yeah. And the ways now that I've done this for 500 plus episodes, I, I understand a little more of what you're listening for when you're interviewing someone. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, what they're not saying, what they don't need to say and, and what you want to either tease out or, you know, just let inform your, your next question or guide um, them toward, but yeah. I mean, sometimes as an interviewer, yeah. you, you're sort of getting them to say certain things you want them to say, you know, I mean, that's, that's, that's oh, yeah. so interesting about, I have interview. a story about recording with Moby a bunch of years ago where I asked Moby about something and he misunderstood what I was asking or what I was trying to get at. And when it finally opened up to him, it was just this, this, oh, well, let me tell you this deep, important thing about my character. Like he suddenly like realized what I was, I was sort of asking about. And then it, it turned into this revelation on both our parts, um, which is pretty entertaining because honestly, I thought he was only going to give me 30 minutes. So we ended up going about an hour and a half, but, um, but that's yeah, the, the the side stories of you know interviewing people. How, you know, how did you, you like Moby? He was a good interviewer. I mean, good, good yeah, interview. Yeah, yeah, he was good. He was open about stuff. I, I literally thought it, he was just going to have the assistant come in at thirty minutes and oh, there's a call for you. But you know, he seemed actively interested in the stuff I was asking about. Um, and his memoir had come out uh, right. in the preceding couple of months, so we had something to to center it on and and work around. But. uh yeah, it was one of those a friend connected us when I mentioned that I was going to be in L.A. for a business trip. And he's like, oh, you got to record with Moby while you're there. I'm like, well, yes, in theory. But you know, then <laughs> two minutes later, there was an email introducing us. I'm like, uh, OK, <laughs> I guess that'll turn into something. Um, so, yeah, the, the show has taken me in some funny directions over the last 10 years. I'll, I'll put it that way. But. You know, I don't interview people as much anymore. Um, and then Do you miss for, that? For a number of reasons. One. All those people that I wanted to interview, well, not all of them, but a lot of those people that I wanted to interview are dead. Like, I, I was obsessed yeah, with, yeah. that when I was in my 20s, I was obsessed with a certain generation that really is gone. Um, yeah. And there aren't, I think as you get older, it's harder to find people uh, that you're ex as excited to talk to. I mean, there are people, sure. there's tons of people I would love to talk to. But it's it changes a little bit. I mean, there was like, you know, I got to interview Norman Mailer and Gore Vidal and all those people. But like, that whole generation just is. Yeah. is you is mentioned changed. Didian the first time we talked. Exactly. And she, I mean, she was on my list, but she was already declining in health by the time I started doing this. So there yeah. was never a, a possibility. But but yeah, I, I literally have a question down here. Just said friendships with older authors is, is with a question mark next to it. So, yes, you, you, this is exactly what I, I, I wonder about with you and and. Both the interviewing and just the the importance of those writers and, and as, oh my gosh, as writers so, and as figures, you know, so important. Well, I think one of the beautiful things about living in New York, or at least until recently, is uh, you had access to all of these intellectuals at your doorstep, you know, in the city, in the same city you were living in, and their lives were here too, and so you could meet your idols. You, you know, it wasn't, they weren't just these far away people that, you know, occasionally rolled through town at a Barnes and Noble, like there, you could see them 
as living beings and in, in, in the world and of the world that you were in. And, and I've been so lucky. And, you know, I still have so many friends who are writers and older writers. Um, I mean, I'm very close to Edmund White. I mean, he's... So I, was, I was just thinking of him. Yeah, because we recorded a few years ago, and that was one of those special... One of those Mount Rushmore's like we were talking about before yeah. we started. Well, yeah. he's like, yeah. you know, he is the best conversationalist, full stop. Mm -hmm. He's just hilarious. He's got a story, a really good story for any occasion. Um, he's the best. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, we've been friends for 20 years. We uh, both are from Cincinnati. So uh, we didn't go to school together, but we like to joke that we we attended high school <laughs> at the same time. Um, but uh, it's it's meant a lot to me, to be honest. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know how you could be a writer and not. I mean, I would be amazed if you could be a writer and not know other writers and feel like you understood or felt confident in the world. I think that you know you need people like you you need to have contact with people like you and and know that but do you feel also the the older generation vibe of it because a lot of people i think would have the oh yeah you know i want to look forward not backward sort of thing and and not understand the value and the importance of of friendships with these i have always again, the, the figures I've always trailblazed i've always valued yeah. being friends with older people uh, in fact i have recently realized that i have very few younger friends yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think no, you're... I'm with you 100 percent. I get this feeling like, boy, we should have been talking a lot more over the last eight years. But but anyway, <laughs> right. I know. I yeah. suddenly I realized that I'm approaching 50, which is crazy to say. And I don't really know any. I mean, I do know a few people in their 20s, but I don't have intimate connections with them. Like I don't, you know, have dinners with them. And like, uh, so I feel like maybe I've dropped the ball a little bit because I think it is important to it's like a relay. You kind of have to pass the b baton on from generation to generation. If, if I'm not trying to make friends with younger people, like those older writers were to me, um, you know, maybe I'm doing a disservice, but it just seems so <laughs> exhausting. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask, because uh, again, when we talked back then, it was about the the slowing down. You know, you had the, boy, I, I can't go out and do all these gallery openings and all this other stuff I used to, to go do. Oh, my God. And that was 2015. You know, we've now entered a, I was, I a much was, more tiring world. You, I mean, yeah. I did not realize at, when we last talked eight years ago what I was saying, because now I am <laughs> a full-on hermit. I can't so even, much more tired. Than I you can't were. even go. I can't go anywhere. I mean, honestly, I never leave my apartment anymore. So I was. What was I? Was probably like, I'm no longer going to go out five nights a week. Yeah. I can't do this. <laughs> uh, but now it's like I can barely get myself to go out once a week. It's. Mm -hmm. I've, I've, it's such a different person. How much of that coincided with with 2020 onwards with the pandemic? So much. Uh, I yeah. feel like I just shut down a certain part of myself socially and I never reactivated it. Do you feel that way? I know some people oh, have just like jumped right back in and can't get enough and good for them. Uh, but I was already, we'll say antisocial ish. I mean, I was, the podcast was my main way of meeting people and going out and, and having these conversations. And, um, yeah, I, I live out in the woods, so I was pretty much in hiding for quite a while. Yeah. And even when I post vaccine, even this, like pre-pandemic, you and I would have been sitting down at a table and, and having this conversation in person. I've, I've fallen back on the remote ones, even for ones that would be, yeah, we could do it. It would just take my afternoon driving into the city, et cetera. Right. And it's, you know, there's 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 absences like that. And, you know, again, there are trade-offs to it, but there's, you know, a, a big negative of just not getting that, that degree of... of of input, I guess that that you know the the serendipity or the sidewalk, you know, just bumping into people, sort of thing. But oh, but completely, yeah, and it's, it's uh, like it's a different thing to sit across from someone, you know, a writer, and and make that connection. But I mean, it's also exhausting to do that. I mean, it's it's real work. Um, yeah. So I think the world has changed that way. Obviously, I mean, it's I spend so much of my time alone. In fact, that's what I've become cognizant of is how much of my life I spend alone. And I think that's, of course, 
part of the job of being a writer is just sort of dealing mm -hmm. with the loneliness of it um, or the aloneness of it. It's not always a negative, um, yeah. but you are kind of stuck to yourself for so much of the time if you really want to get work done. And and it almost creeps me out how how accustomed I've gotten to it, to be honest. Um, <laughs> that's the scary part. The scary part isn't that I'm alone all the time. It's that like I really don't mind it. Yeah. Um, that, has it helped with the writing? Yeah, yeah. Um I think that I think that it's uh I think it's actually a secret weapon to be able to be alone so much. And so that always helps with the writing. Um, my writing has changed a lot. I write in the mornings now. Um, I wake up, mm -hmm. I drink coffee in bed and, and read, and then I get to writing. And then I'm pretty much by one o'clock kind of done with the creative aspect of my, of my day. And then I can do sort of all the other stuff. Um, but, uh, Whereas I think, you know, even when I was talking to you for Orion, I would write in the evenings um, or in the afternoons. I keep getting earlier and earlier. Um, yeah. Now that said, I, also I think it was like balancing 10, that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's I'm, I'm my wife and I watch Barney Miller, New Heart, MASH and Mary Tyler Moore reruns oh. and then in bed by 930 or 10. So, oh yeah, my God, I'm, new, I'm you, like, new Heart. Wait, is that yeah. Newhart? Was Newhart with the hotel no, the, in Vermont? No, this is the seventies one when he was a, oh. a a therapist in Chicago. Oh, so right. when right, he was married right, right, to right. Suzanne Blachette. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes. So we're watching those. We'll move on to the the, the Newhart in Vermont uh, once we finish another hundred and fifty episodes, I guess. But you know. <laughs> it's um yeah, going to bed at ten o'clock, getting up at five, that's sort of the the, the except uh, as to continue uh, from twenty fifteen, I'm still not writing writing. I I do this instead, because this is, you know, enough of an artistic outlet. Alive. I've I've I figure. You know, I'm 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 reconciled with this as being my my uh Artistic legacy. We'll, we'll just put it that way, I guess. I keep when you mentioned to take at least a back painting then, class. I started drawing at fifty and got decent. I'll, I'll send you a link to, to that stuff. Um, of late, I've had a, a anxiety and inertia that has kept me from picking up a pen. But I, I just did a couple of sketches yesterday and started to feel like, oh yeah, you're you're not as bad as you've been telling yourself. Wait, Gil, what kind of drawing? Uh, I started a few weeks after turning 50 by going in my backyard and drawing trees. And That's that beautiful. rapidly evolved into, well, the original drawings look like a stroke victim who was just regaining function in his hand. <laughs> and within three or four weeks, they turned into like good drawings of trees. And it was one of those, huh, well, I've never actually stuck with anything in my life except for the podcast. And so it turns out if you practice something regularly, you might get better at it. And were you, were you, 50, just, that's, that's what were I you just like, were you following some sort of, uh, lesson or were you just doing it on your own nope. freehand and like, I just sat it out? outside, looked at a tree and drew, I just, how do I get what I'm looking at onto this page? And in the process, I learned how to look and mm -hmm. it was it was revelatory for so you got this to look forward to at 50 um that but yeah it, it just yeah I, I'll, I'll send you a link because some of the stuff actually got really good the problem was uh, eventually the leaves came in so i started having to figure out color and then uh, uh then things got weird from there i started with watercolors and other really stuff into but, the pastels or something yeah yeah it turned into gill discovering all sorts of ways of looking at the world and himself that he had not conceived of before which you know, is the upside of, of, you know, time going into a straight I, I line. At least happen. there's opportunities. Yeah. So keep your eyes open is what I'm saying. Take the class, uh, see what someone can teach you about drawing. Um, because it really, from my experience, um, I believe I have no talent whatsoever. It's just reps and, and looking at things and learning to slow down and see, but it, it, it changes the, the world you're looking at both you know the organic and inorganic um and it just makes things it makes the world jump out at you in different ways which will probably feed back into your writing um i wanted but, to do portraits yeah, we'll, we'll see you know, I, yeah I i've done a do few I, <laughs> I i i've done drawings of i started doing drawings of every author i finished reading last year I'm about 24 in at this point. I'm hoping to do it this year too, which means I'll be doing a, a drawing of you at some point. Oh my God, um, exciting. 
Yeah. Yeah. Did John Berger, the guy who did uh, Ways of Seeing, that, that uh, one. That one was a hoot. So, how cool? Yeah. Were you it's, interviewed um, him? No, no, just people I've read. Like some people uh, I read extracurricularly. Right. Um, it's 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 that balancing act. The upside is one of the authors I finished last year was Pynchon, so I don't have to worry about drawing him. So right, um, right. Just yeah. the paper bag. <laughs> yeah. Uh <-huh. laughs> but anyway, this is me prattling on about stuff I've I've prattled on about at length. But yeah, finding new angles. And, and new ways of, of whether it's solely in writing or in, in other, you know, forms of artistic expression, that's, yeah, it's something to look forward to about your life, or at least to open yourself to those opportunities, you know? Exactly. And that's what I really want to do. That's, that's what I, I want to do. Uh, I really want to get serious about taking a language class and I want to get serious about painting or watercolors. I think that would be really Where do you want to visit? Well, you know that I'm, it's so funny. I have been trying to, I mean, I love New York. I don't want to say anything negative about yeah. it, but I have a, my new fantasy is to spend six months out of the year in, in Europe, which I have really re I have always loved Europe, but I've really kind of fallen in yeah. love with it recently. And, um, I've been trying to spend a lot of time there. I actually tried to get my German pass citizenship through my grandfather, but, uh, Unfortunately, he uh, it didn't work out. They wouldn't take me because uh, he became an American citizen before my father was born. And so if it only happened after, I would have had a case. But uh. I'm, anyway, I um, the world, Gil, I really want to just I really want to spend six months out of here writing in just like a completely different environment. Also, maybe Chile. I've always wanted to go to Santiago. So um yeah, I'm excited. That's one one real real luxury of writing the books that I write is that I try to base them in a different place each time. And and some cities don't open themselves. I was just in Madrid for a month over um, Chris, Christmas. I, mean, I love yeah, Madrid. But, uh, <laughs> it's such yeah. an it's such a great uh, city. I don't think that it has a book for me there, um, and it doesn't mean it's mm -hmm. anything about it. That I just like didn't find the the novel there, but. Um, but I just love to, you know, find those cities or those places and, and really discover them and try to put them into a into a novel. So I want to keep doing that until the tarot card reader uh, <laughs> proves accurate. <laughs> Do you see yourself, well, depending on what you're writing now, with the, we'll say, the intrusion of the political into the, the most recent novel? Do you see right. that as a, an ongoing thing? Um, well, I mean, there's always a little taste of the political everything's political yeah um yeah. right but this one of course was much more so um because of the because of what's happening you know with cc and uh, a dictatorship in egypt um the next novel actually also takes place in egypt it's a very short horror novel that was originally meant to be a short mm -hmm. story but it as i was waiting for my edits it kept growing and growing and then sort of became mm -hmm. uh I was my only horror and it's actually not like a slasher. It's more of like a psychological, you know, car crash, yeah. but, um, it's set in Luxor, which is down the Nile, um, w uh, near the Valley of the Kings. And, uh, it takes place in a hotel, um, a little bit, but not really that political. And then the one I'm writing now is, uh, set in Paris and it's not very political. So I don't know. I mean, you know, some places I think you can't, you have to address it. And in some places it just sort of can be in the background. Um, Do you find your approach to characters and settings has changed since the, the pandemic? Or do you, mm. do you sort of avoid its existence? I have avoided of... its existence. Oh, no, that's okay. not true because yeah. the, the horror is all about the pandemic. It's set in the, it's mm -hmm. set during the pandemic and like people sort of stuck at a hotel, um, because they can't really leave or they come to like get away from, from the pandemic. So, uh, in that case, yeah. yes, but I don't put masks on people for the most part. And I don't really know what to do with it. Kind of reminds me of the advent of cell phones. Do you remember like back in like 2006 when <laughs> writers were scared to put cell phones in their book, you know, like yeah. <laughs> everyone was using a cell phone, but not in books. Uh, uh, so I think yeah. it takes. It's like, well, it what takes if they're like, not here in ten years? You know. Yeah. 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 Um, because you don't want to date yourself too much. I think, like, also, like, 
it was also like the same with social media. Like, how do you put social media into a book? It takes a while to figure out. So I think maybe now people are putting masks on their characters a bit more. Hmm. Yeah, I wonder in that just in terms of how you approach a story, given the you know, given what the last couple of years have been and and what it's shown us about human nature, um, you know, how much it changes the way you'd write certain characters or the way you feel you know, yeah. going into a, a significant plot. But, but yeah, it's, um, it's a challenge for the writers out there. I just do this and I, I get by a lot easier. Um, <laughs> I should ask my, my wife asked me yesterday about my five favorite episodes of the, of, of the podcast. And I, I kept shifting my, my answers around, but, uh, do you have a, a top few, a couple of interviews that people done? you've, you've, yeah, the ones that are just like, well, this is my my top three, you know, um, I, greatest, no, actually, uh, interview, greatest I, interview experiences. Yeah. I recently reread yeah. the interview I did with Robert Stone, believe it or not, and I thought yeah. it was really terrific. I mean, not my questions so much as his answers. Um, yeah, and so I have to I have to kind of throw that one out as a really great interview. I interviewed Toni Morrison, and she was, I mean, it, again, it had nothing to do with me. Uh, it was all her, you know what I mean? Like it was, I could have been anybody. Um, but, uh, so that's definitely up there. Um, you know, I interviewed Lawrence Ferlinghetti and he was amazing. Um, this was probably 10 years ago, but he, I remember that interview just being like, I love the ones where like, they just, you break out like their whole history and there's just, it's just like a, it's just like a, a snowstorm of amazing each, each like little yeah. lake is just like, <laughs> oh, my God, you know, like every sentence. Is, oh, yeah. Is this bold. was the time Mailer and I went off and did. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> when you get all those, I mean, those, these yeah. legends. I mean, they yeah. really have they have real stories to tell, which I guess, you know, like that's a great thing, because I think now if you do everything remotely, the stories are going to be vastly different. Like when I went over to yeah. see Robert Stone, he was on oxygen. He was living on the Upper mm-hmm. East Side and uh, in a little apartment with his wife. And I bought them a plant on the way because there was like a really beautiful plant on their a store on their block. And, mm-hmm. you know, just like those little details kind of bring it to life, you know? Yeah. So when I'm 80 years old and rambling on to no one interviewing me, I'm sure <laughs> I, can, I can tell that plant story. Um, <laughs> At the time I saw Robert Stone. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. But what was your favorite? Like, what's your top one? Oh, my number one is Clive James. I flew oh, wow. to England for 48 hours to sit down with, with – to, I got to London. I spent uh, – stayed overnight, went up to Cambridge. And I sat down with somebody who, at the time, we thought was going to be dead within a year. He lived another four or five years after, but um, it was still just a r- amazing conversation with someone whose literary work I'd idolized, and we really hit it off. And it was just one of those, wow, everything came together and was tremendous. Then I went and recorded with his wife, and then I recorded with the translator and Thea Bell, like all in the same afternoon. And it was just one of those... God damn, this is one of the greatest days of my life. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I just had three amazing conversations. I'm going to head back to London, get on a plane tomorrow morning and come home. And I spent 48 hours in England just, uh, I joke, it's my Reggie Jackson in the 77 World Series, just belting home run after home run after home run. And I'm like, well, I can go home. I can quit the show now, frankly. I've I've hit my, my peak. Unfortunately, as an addict, I, I can't quit. But uh, <laughs> but that one in particular, because yeah, it was someone I, I knew that. there wasn't a second chance. And, and the Harold Bloom, I had a great time oh, wow. with. Yeah. But but he was he was just Bloom being Bloom. I was just there for the ride. But yeah. Well, some, his, people his, not, so much, um, some people aren't really a conversation. They're just like, you know, right. you're sitting through a lecture and that can be great, too. But it's it's a very different yeah. thing. Well, his. But they actually used audio from our conversation for his memorial service back at the beginning of 2020 because apparently I did get something out of him that people were not getting at that point. That's amazing. Probably because I started the well, I started the conversation by asking him uh, in your new book. You said you do not want a, a memorial service of any kind, but uh, what poem would you want read at your your memorial or graveside? He's like, well. 
if they choose to ignore my wishes. And then he starts declaiming this Wallace Stevens poem, and it just starts getting bigger and bigger and bigger coming out of his mouth. And I'm like, well, most of the guy started off with the right question. <laughs> Got him kind of, you know, into the poetry and into what it means to him as a man who was dying, um, which is oh, very different beautiful. than... You know, what you and I go through when we're talking about what's your next book about, you know? Right, right. Um, but yeah, it's it's uh, daring to ask some questions, I guess, is is one of the things I've picked up, you know, that people don't want to be asked the same thing again and again. So uh, finding the, the stuff, even if it's a little uncomfortable, like talking about um, the world without you and uh, what right. death means. You know which books really matter when you start to see the the the, the shadow. Um, that's been to me illuminating because I can go back and see these these great lives like Milton Glaser and people like that who I got to record with. You know, in the last year of their lives, and uh, sort of get that as you were talking about with the older people, just the the summation of someone's life and someone's great life. Um, I wonder it is, it if there's. I I I truly wonder if if there are twenty year olds that want to interview the sort of canon of writers in their fifties, the way I wanted to interview a canon of writers when I was tw in in my twenties. And I think maybe the yeah. the the sort of uh, mystique of literature has changed so much. And, sure. You know what I mean? I don't know if we produce legends the same way anymore. And and that's not a bad thing. I mean, you know, it's it's it opens a door for more diversity and more oh, voices absolutely. that are not being kept in. But yeah, it, but it is something we miss. You know, yeah. I mean, for me, you know, as a college kid, it was it was, you know, Gaddis and people like that, like these these monumental figures. And, and it gave you something to shoot for, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Boy, that's that's you know, <laughs> it, 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 there's a lot of you know thing, how things have changed. Um, you know, talking about Roth and Bellow, Nabokov's another one where uh, one of my guests recently said people won't be reading Lolita within ten years. No, that it, it just it can't. It, it, this guy's take was it can't survive the cultural pressure, and I was like, it was written to be against all of that like it, it was written to be about a monster who's beautiful so i don't know i'm sure i i, you know. I feel the exact opposite of that of, of yeah. that person i feel like that's going to last forever because of that reason um yeah. it seems to me like as fresh as it did then right i mean that seems like as relevant as ever yeah it's it's you know i just don't know because i'm not around kids uh what the cultural oh, pushback right. oh, really means but i feel like you know yeah. culture is such a big clumsy oaf like the correction that was made w was necessary and incredible but like culture is always takes everything too far like always makes everything like so unnuanced and and, and so then it's just going to bounce back the, another way and everything we thought this way is going to turn that way. You know, like every generation sort of like critiques the generation before. So sure. I don't think that you make it's sort of these death sentences to certain uh, are ever final to, to mm -hmm. works of art. And things always get rediscovered. I was laughing because uh, this morning I was listening to, to that first Kate Bush album and the idea that that that. Running up that hill became the biggest song in the world uh, last summer. Was one of those. I'm very happy this happened. It's weird that you know, people didn't know this song, but I guess we're old now, and and you know the things that were the most meaningful to us need to show up on a, a TV show for other people to, to pick right, up on. Them. Right. I mean, it's good for Kate Bush. It must be thrilled. Yeah. Well, God knows what streaming royalties are like, but still, yeah, it's it's you know that sense of the things that get rediscovered or, or repicked up. Who have you found literarily? Like, who are you reading that you just, wow, I never thought this person would be on my radar. But um, I just spent, I was a, I've, I've been a judge for the Penn Faulkner Awards this year. And oh, so wow. I was reading all the books. Well, not all of them. We had two other judges with me uh, on the panel and the three of us tackled, I think, 508 novels. <laughs> So I have been reading all a lot of debut writers um, 
it was a it was a, a monumental task. I'm a slow reader, and so it was uh, a lot to just be reading for the last six months all of these novels from 2022. But I, you know, you realize what a little bubble you live in because all of these books are published, and you never heard of so many of them, and yeah. they deserve they deserve to be heard of. And you know, it's a little heartbreaking almost as you realize how much gets published that isn't you know sort of brought with a big party and. Um, but uh, it was great because I had I learned about so many writers I had never, ever heard of before and so many voices that I had, you know, no touch with um, and probably would never have found their their novels otherwise. So for me, that was the real because you know, I tend to like recede into uh, early 20, early to mid 20th century. You know what I mean? Like that's yeah. where I go when I want to read a book. Um and so that was just really exciting um, to read all of these new voices and, and unfamiliar names. Any sort of recurring themes or weirdness of, wow, I didn't realize people were writing like this at this point? Well, there was a lot of magical realism, which I thought was mm -hmm. was really interesting and surprising, especially from um, sort of non-white. A lot of immigrant stories were uh, rendered in in magical realism um so that was like one i thought like kind of big big theme uh what else i was just a lot of debut, not writing a lot about of TikTok debut, or anything. a lot of debut writers yeah in fact it was kind of hard to find there were i mean there were a few big names that we all know some household names but not that many um mm -hmm. i don't know if it was just one of those years but i didn't you didn't feel like it was a year where you knew who the winner was and it was very clear who was going to win. And it's, you know, the, that like that Roth novel that yeah. everyone, you know, loves right. kind of thing. So it, that was a real education. Um, but I'm, I'm done with it. So like now I'm free and now I, unfortunately I've been rereading some Graham green, which is probably not what <laughs> I should be doing, but <laughs> um, sometimes you gotta get the, the old voices back in your head, you know? Yeah. Yeah, were there writers you avoided during the uh, the Lost Americans? Well, there were certainly depictions of Egypt I didn't want to read. Um, yeah, I didn't want to read any novel set in Egypt uh, because I was, you know, afraid that I would start, you know, by accident incorporating their details. Yeah. Um, and you know, the 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 novel does follow a sort of basic thriller format and so i you know anything that like gets near brother and sister relationships um i was really reading a lot of of, of nonfiction on egypt and arms sales and one of the actual things that really intrigued me about that that got me started writing was like how when someone dies overseas when a loved one dies overseas how limited you are power wise to yeah. to do anything. I mean, you think that like you sort of like there, you believe in this idea of justice, justice will prevail or answers eventually come to the surface. But uh, when someone dies overseas, you don't, you, first of all, it's, it's surrounded in a mist and you can't really, you know, you, you don't know the place, you don't understand. And also it's, you know, uh, the jurisdiction of the country and whatever they decide, whatever they decide the cause of death was, um, unless the government intercedes, American government intercedes, which it usually doesn't, uh, or isn't usually allowed to. So you're sort of like at the mercy of this foreign government um, to, to, to send your loved one home. And I, so I was obsessed with that idea of, of, you know, what happens when you know something, something malicious happened yeah. and there's no proof of it. There's no evidence offered you and there's just, there's nothing uh, that you can do about it. And so that was sort of the basic uh, premise that got the, you know, the, be the, the beginning of the runway that, that got them going. Mm -hmm. So I was reading a lot about legal aspects of it. I'm doing a lot of research. Um, most of, you know, like when you do research for a novel, most of it ends up on the cutting room floor. Like you don't, like my last <laughs> novel I wrote, I, I read, I did so much research on silver, on antique uh, colonial silver, Amer colonial American silver, uh, and there were like whole chapters on that. Of course, thank God I cut them. I mean, that would have bored everyone to, to death, but it was necessary research because, you know, at least 
you can feel it. Hopefully you can feel it in the, in the stuff that does make it the, the sense that there is a sort of knowledge of the world, uh, the writers is, is, is addressing. So, um, so yeah, it was really a lot of, of that kind of bizarre books on, on, on weapon sales too, that I didn't think I'd ever be interested in reading or ever end up consuming. Yeah. But, um, but feels the economics and everything else you, you create all the, the business decisions and everything feel real. Yeah. You know, they, they feel as though these are, are thought out processes, what it means to, for the U S to approve sales of X, Y, and Z to a country and what it means when, you know, absolutely uh, things and, move around. Yeah. yeah. And you know, that it's terrifying. Well, when, in my research, I was talking to a lot of weapons experts uh, via Zoom or Skype because it was during the pandemic. And one of them told me, and it stuck in my head, they said, you know, after uh, drugs, weapons is the most dangerous business on the planet. It, and that includes like even legitimate uh, defense contracting firms. I mean, it's if you think that like you're going to get away with blackmailing them or threatening them and you know, I think there's a level of paranoia there of, of people who work in that industry for good reason. Um, right. And so it was just, you know, I think it's just such a dark and frightening place. Um, yeah. And so I wouldn't. That's why you have that, that great even. Vonnegut quote, yeah, the, the, the great Vonnegut quote at the beginning of the book that you use to. Yes. Highlight that. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? I mean, I just stumbled on that because I was like sort of rereading Slaughterhouse Five, which is what it's in. And uh, it just said it, it all said it all so perfectly, um, <laughs> which is basically like, yeah, don't it's... let your, you know, kids <clears throat> end up working for, uh, you know, uh, defense contractors, basically, or weapons of war. Right. Now, <clears throat> when we recorded in 2015, you were um, on the cusp of turning 40 and going through what you referred to at the time as a reverse midlife crisis of like finally settling down, buying real estate and, and, you know, becoming an adult, um, the preceding seven or eight years, uh, how has that been? How's, how's life changed for you? What is the cusp of 50 look like? Well, I lost that house. I lost that real estate kill. Yeah. <laughs> I, um, I had to say, uh, you know, that's, that's really amazing. Is this it, something you don't want to talk about? No, no, I do want to talk about it. I mean, okay. I'm, I'm totally okay. happy to talk about it. Um, I, after the pandemic, I ended a very long relationship and I had to sell the house to uh, get the apartment in the city. Um, and, you know, it was really tough. I'm so thankful I went through it. But, um, you know, it just that's life is you realize as soon as you think that something's going to last forever or you it just blows up in your face so um yeah. now i think i'm having a reverse reverse midlife crisis <laughs> the, the normal midlife crisis now, now i'm just having a midlife <laughs> crisis a little late um but better late than never now i'm just like trying to you know travel to europe and and and, and not own property um i have to say i miss that house so much i thank god i had it during the pandemic that's where i wrote this whole book uh the first draft of it and and a lot of it's set in the berkshires at the beginning um, and I miss it. It was, it was, it was heaven. But I, I remember when I, after I sold it the first time, the, the temperature dipped below freezing, I remember I think, uh, oh, and I thought, oh, God, I don't have to worry about the pipes anymore. It's not, <laughs> it's not my responsibility. Like, it's amazing. Like yeah. how much is taken off your plate. I, I felt like, you know, between like, worrying about like the lawn and the roof and how to, I felt like so much of my time was consumed with driving there and driving home or like, when are we going to drive home or when are we going to go out there? I mean, it's just, it's, it's too, yeah. it was too much. And so I feel like a whole, a whole set of worries have, have just disintegrated and, and it's been freeing. It's sad, but it's, yeah. you know, there are other houses. But a new phase of life. Yeah. Yeah. Did you like the, non be, just being outside the city I loved like it. that was it important to okay i loved it i loved it now if i would ever do it again uh which i i probably won't but if i ever bought another house i'd like to be by the sea um instead of the mountains but i loved getting out of the city um and i miss that aspect i miss the nature yeah yeah i, I well as i've told you before i live in the house i grew up in and there's just hundreds and hundreds of feet of woods behind my house uh, and, and 
That's the deer easy. wandering around and, and and the occasional bear. But do you, you have know, coyotes? I miss the screaming coyotes yeah. in the night. Yeah, that middle of the night, and you, 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 they show up in the book, as I recall, yes. um, in the Lost Americans. Yeah, there's there's two o'clock in the morning. You hear this screaming down the hill. I'm like, well, looks like the it's either coyotes or foxes. We weren't sure which uh, which ones were having a good time. But, I loved it. Um, I loved that sound so much. <laughs> <laughs> I miss that a lot. Yeah, it's uh again like the first time my wife came to visit here in, in New Jersey. You know, when we were first dating. Um, she just, it's a, uh, it's a lot of bugs, a lot of, a lot of insect miss, noise here. I don't, I'm like, yeah. the, I don't miss the ticks. That is something. And yeah, there's the, that too. I but was it's just hearing the chorus obsessed. of the crickets and everything like that. But, uh, oh yeah, yeah. No, we had a, a greyhound who we referred to as a ginger tick magnet because <laughs> literally three steps out of the house and there'd be like five ticks on him. Like how did, we, we, were, we were just on the front step. Where did they come from? But, I know. Yeah. Um, that I do not it's, miss. It's, I, like, sometimes I would just find, like, I would always be like searching for the tick on my body. I think for like, it was seven yeah. years straight. <laughs> I was just, it was, it was, it was too much. Um, maybe and then that, there's, are they on my socks? It's always the on your socks you have to watch out for because then they'll they'll get up onto your leg from there. But yes. yeah, it's um. Yeah, I would. I again, remember. It's, it's I remember. I would be asleep and I would wake up and there would be a tick in the bed. I'd be like, "Has it been on me? <laughs> is it is it leaving yeah. or is it coming? Yeah. What's going? On? Yeah, it just it's, it's a smoking a little cigarette, just lying. Yeah, constant yeah. terror <laughs> um, that I do not miss yeah. of that. But yeah, you know, it's 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 strange, and and I have to say, um, maybe this is too personal, but it's strange to approach fifty, being single, and mm -hmm. not having children, not owning a car. I think this is another thing about being a writer, not going to an office where you see people. Um, it's almost like you've made it this far through life, and somehow nothing stuck to you. Uh, yeah. which is not a good thing or a bad thing. It's just, it's bizarre. Um, yeah. So, I, and I, do, and I love it. And, and, and also it seems sad. I don't know. I've, uh, yeah. this is thus the crisis, but um, it's a strange time, you know, to be uh, approaching, approaching 50 and, and, and being in that situation. But it's yeah. also like, I, mean, I love freedom. I mean, I love the idea of, I was of just going to say, you love the idea of being able to, to go. To, to yeah. pick up and, and actually, you know, again, spend six months out of the city if you could. You know. Yeah. Paris but, yeah. was a no, Paris was a great uh, a, a great thing for me. I was there for seven months. Just got to know the city so well. Was writing. Um, you could never do that, uh, you know, if you had if even a, the ginger greyhound would would yeah. have been <laughs> would have been a problem. But uh, I'm with you. What language you mentioned wanting to learn a language? What would uh if you could only pick one? Uh, Italian, and I've been trying to learn Italian okay. since I was twenty three and living. And I, <laughs> that summer, I lived in Venice. Um, I've been I'm a one hundred and one student for for about almost <laughs> fifty. Years? Yeah. yeah, for the, how many long is that? Uh, it's been a real challenge, but uh, yeah, yeah. I think I'm going to take an, a, a night class. I think is is my new plan. Ideally, I would have an Italian painting professor who also uh, could, you know, help me with my tennis serve. Perfect. You triple up and, and you yeah. know, I'm sure there is a Craigslist listing for that <laughs> right. person somewhere. You know that person exists yeah. somewhere in New York and is looking for $20 yeah. an hour. I mean, it's a very good rate. Uh, that's, a, that's the one thing you miss about, you know, if not being in New York is just the there's everything. Right, <laughs> you, you exactly. just have to look and yeah. everything is here. So. Yeah, that's got to be. Well, again, for me, I've always been 25 miles away. I can come in, you know, and, and then run away from the city when I need to. But but the other thing we, we talked about uh, back in, in 15 was that the concern that that writing magazines and books and, and the writing life, I guess, um, might not be a lifelong gig. Not mm -hmm. that you didn't have to drive, but that, you know, the, the, the economics and the business of it all was was potentially, you know, uh, uh, not going to let that happen. Right. Has that vibe changed? Do you see either your writing or sort of the, the, you know, the publishing industry and ecosystem, you know, working any better 
as far as you're you're concerned, or is it things getting even more depressing than I, I think I they don't are? Think, I don't think they're getting depressing. I think people learn, learn how to live with, you know, the way things go. I think it's sad that magazines have sort of evaporated. I, I was, yeah. I just went yesterday in New York City on the Upper West Side. There was someone who had written a small thing in, in a very big magazine, I won't name it, um, about the book, just a little, you know, small thing, but I wanted to, to buy a copy of the magazine to keep it. And I went to five or six places, a bookstores, a Dwayne Reed. I mean, like uh, no one had magazines yeah. anymore, like at all. Right. <laughs> they weren't there. They were gone. The, the kiosk that used to sell magazines now no longer sells magazines. I could not find this magazine or a magazine at all. Yeah. I mean, so that is has changed that's to me that that represents the fact that you know i think i mean maybe it's all online now but it's there's there are no more magazines so right that's sad but i you know i think that writers are wily creatures and have adapted and i think that there's still great amounts of reading to be done online so i guess everyone is still floating along and doing well um i think that I don't know if I would enter mag, you know, I don't think I would enter publishing the same way as a, as a side job if as a, as a 20 year old. And I'm sure most aren't, but, um, but yeah, I, I don't, but I'm not doom and gloomy about it. I think, you know, that's just the way that the way things go. Um, and again, you've got another three plus novels in you exactly. before. <laughs> before I start selling cars, which is the next. And before the, the, maybe that's what the tarot reader was trying to get across. Just, I, think know, get she was. She, I think she was, uh, I, I was actually thinking that maybe she thought I would go into movies, but you know, it could be anything just maybe yeah, an early retirement. You know, we, we, we talked about it, you know, this, this one in particular feels cinematic. I have to go back and read the destroyers and uh, beautiful crime and make sure they, uh, you know, again, they all fit into the cinematic ball and verse. Yes, and we, you have uh, to, they will. I, I promise you. I love those books. Um, yeah. I kind of, do, do you, I kind of miss you, those locations to write about, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, how much do the, uh, how much do you sort of pine for, you know, just where, where they were set and, and what it meant to sort of really get into an environment like that? Well, Venice is a, a city that was for the last book of beautiful crime. It's set in Venice. And that is a city that means the world to me. I love it so much. As I hinted, I was 23 years old and I went over there uh, for uh, to work as an intern at the Peggy Guggenheim. And it has remained in my blood ever since. And uh, so, you know, I still have a little piggy bank in a drawer uh, I collect change for the apartment that I want to buy in Venice. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm so smitten with that city. And so that was a, such a joy to write that book because I felt, I knew the city so well. Um, I missed the city so much. I reveled in any time I could, you know, look up a church and write about it and, and make it a backdrop for a scene. That was a city I felt so comfortable. It was like New York in a way. I felt so comfortable writing about it. I didn't worry. Cairo, I worried about. Um, even Paris, I feel a little like, even though I spent you know seven months there, I'm writing about it now. And there are certain moments where I'm like, ooh, this, I, I feel like I'm. This isn't exactly right. I'm going to have to you know talk to some Paris friends and make sure that this is the right park that this would happen in. But um, sure. but you know, Venice was was is so special that way to just as a city I know and it's it's in my blood. Um, and so I miss it. I'd love to write, write another book there, but I kind of, I, I feel like I kind of do the city. Uh, yeah. I was wondering whether you ever feel like we've not in the sequel sense, but just revisiting a place in a book after you've, you've sort of, I mean, I think it would be fun to, to go back to Orient in a way. It would be a much shorter book. Um, <laughs> and it would be, a, it's, but it's a, you know, my prediction is true. It was true. I mean, it was an easy prediction to make, but, um, it, it's a, it costs a fortune now. The real estate there, you know, I couldn't. I could have bought a little house there uh, in 2015. Now I couldn't buy a car there. I mean, it's like yeah. you know, it's so expensive, and uh, it's a, it's a very changed place. It's still beautiful, but um, it's just already a different a different environment. It's a different city or a different location to write yeah. about. Whereas Venice is always Venice, Cairo is always Cairo, Paris is kind of always Paris. New York is kind of always neat. Eh, New York has changed a lot. Eh. 
Yeah. <laughs> New York chain has changed a I mean, lot lately. There's still plenty here or there, but yeah, it's it's a different city than you would have written about 10, 15 years ago. Yeah, for sure. For sure. The last question. We'll talk about postcards. Ah. I send postcards every day. Tell me about your, your postcard before uh, habit I, before or Before I practice. tell you about my postcard yeah. habit, what postcard do you send every day? Is it a different? Well, I had been. Oh, yeah. Well, I was working through these different box sets. And, and in 2022, when I started the daily postcard thing, I went through uh, the Met collection, uh, like the, the, the 100 postcards from the, the Met, and then 100 uh, books uh, book covers by Penguin. Um I had a 50 set from MoMA of uh, female art or artists uh, at, at MoMA and a few other sets. I'm, I'm working through a different Penguin Classics uh, uh, box set right now, but I just picked up a bunch from the Philly Museum. They have a dozen Cy Twombly Iliad based Ooh. Uh, uh, uh artworks he did that they've done as a, a series and i have to figure out I, I don't have an overarching plan with any of these things i just mail them out you know i figure out who i'm going to send to each day sometimes it's whoever wrote me in the last week and oh yeah i should send that guy a postcard um but yeah so i just i just work through these things in 2022 i actually did a video every morning where i would pull the postcard from the box so it would be a reveal for me and the the viewer um that eventually became too much of an ego vanity thing. Mm -hmm. So I kind of ended it at the end of, of last year. I still do the postcard. I just don't do a whole, you know, here's me reflecting on what the postcard is, what the song in my head is, doing the little David Lynch weather report sort of video that, uh, that I, I started that year. It was good, but it just became... Sometimes I was doing the video and not getting around to sending out the postcard that day. Oh, right. So that's when I realized, yeah, I need to actually prioritize the postcard. My ego and, and views and all that stuff can be secondary. But, well, but anyway, I do not make my own. I've, I've made one or two postcards my own, of my own. I painted a bird for Caleb Crane, who posts aww, all these great birding I know pictures. And, yeah, so I took one Does that he, he really uh, from somebody all those else. Pictures? Yeah, They're as far so as I know. Good. Unless he's a... He's got a good camera, a good eye, and, you know, Prospect Park, apparently, you know, even the bald eagle shows up there. Um, so sometimes I draw some of his birds, but this one time I thought, I'm going to send him a postcard of a bird from somebody else's photos that he's he's never shot. And uh, at least online, he mentioned that uh, he kind of cried a little bit when he saw it because it, it was Aww. a really good watercolor and, and uh, took me days to, to, you know, get everything as, as well as I did. But uh but yeah, so occasionally I'll make my own, but generally it's just a, a you know, pull a postcard out of the box, figure out who I'm going to send it to that morning and uh, fire away right after I do my journal. So That's amazing. But how about this you? is not, I don't have the same postcard uh, relationship that you do at all. You can say fetish. It's okay. A fe <laughs> fetish addiction. <laughs> Um, <laughs> mine is, 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 nor is just sort of a normal postcard. I've always been obsessed with the mail. And actually, I think this is actually one of my weaknesses as a writer is my inability to embrace, uh, tech. I, I think mm -hmm. in a way, I still think very 20th century when it comes to plots. And, uh, I try to, I try to avoid clues or information via jpeg so anyway yeah. i uh which is there, there were moments in the book where i wasn't quite sure like early on like how far when, where it was when it was set right until right. somebody mentions an app at one point i'm like okay so this is post iphone and right. far enough along i'm like and i felt that was deliberate on your part at least to give it a you know, let's just get you into the story. You could figure out when it's taking place later. Yeah, I yeah, I think it was. I mean, I had so much, I had, this book was so much longer than I ended up. Uh, I ended up cutting so much that I can't remember. I had some 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 early scenes that got that got cut that might have made it clearer. But um, mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, in the book, one of the main clues is that the the brother who travels a lot as a defense tech is a uh, sends his sister postcards from places that he visits. Uh, it's like a thing he's done. They don't really have like a very good relationship and they're not f phone people. They're not, they don't really talk on the phone. They don't text, yeah. but he sends a postcard every time. Um, and she collects, you know, she keeps them. So he sends a very strange message to her. It, it arrives after his death. Um, that seems odd. And so it was, it's a bit of like a flag that's, that the, you know, 
eventually leads her to to go to Cairo. Um, so that's a, that's a big part of it. And I remember when I was writing it, it was during the pandemic and there was the whole thing about wiping your mail off. And I was thinking like, is this the end of mail? And like, should I be really writing a book that has mail as like a, a key moment? Is this, is dating it too much? Um, but you know, you, we all still get mail. I check my mail every day. Um, do you? I don't understand people who don't. I've sent people. Uh, dude, I get the USPS email that tells me what my mail is going to be oh, that wow. day. <laughs> yeah. It, it's just little scans of every envelope and, and postcard that's coming in. But like I've had friends like, oh, yeah, I, I got your postcard. It must have come in a week or so ago. I didn't check my mail. I'm like, how do, how do you not check know, your mail? I that's a sign that the universe day. is still going. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I love I, mail I, and, you, and I love postcards. So I have always sent postcards. Postcards are like magazines. They're harder and harder to find, actually, even if you go to yeah. a Venice or, you know, like you go to a, a, a vacation destination. They're not they're still there, but they're not as, you know, prominent as they once yeah. were. But um, I, I send one to my grandmother about once a month. Um, I hope that she's collecting them because I want them all back at the end. <laughs> <laughs> but I've been sending them for since I was, uh, you know, 19. So a, yeah. a lot of postcards. Um, and then I send to whenever I go on a trip, I send about seven or eight postcards. And of mm -hmm. course, I'm the only person who does this. Well, besides you, because whenever someone gets them, they're like, I don't I can't believe it. <laughs> it like, shocks people <laughs> that they still exist. Yeah. But I love them so much. I love but they, I love a they postcard. carry this this meaning a there's the slowness like when somebody emails you to say they got your postcard do you get pissed like i, I tend to have the uh, you know I, I sent you the postcard you don't have to email me to say you received it write me a postcard or a letter send that instead that'll that'll mean something more it'll be slower but it's also it just means you know when somebody sees that in, the, in their their mail they realize somebody thought about me enough to to write this card, put a stamp on it, and either walk down to their mailbox, walk down to a post office or whatever. Yeah. You know, it's just a... But I, just, uh, I, I, I this disagree is the, with you, but maybe because I'm mailing them yeah. from another country, I uh, I actually get upset if, if someone doesn't acknowledge it because I'm desperate to know if it made it to them. <laughs> I just like getting the post, like a postcard back after in, in response. I've never and I've had, gotten a postcard back. No one has ever. Oh gosh, I have a stack of them here of people who've written me back and I still need to write back too. I, of course, uh, have saved every piece of personal correspondence I've received since I was 17 oh um, because I'm nuts. But trust me, I'm also antisocial, so it's not that big a collection. <laughs> but the, but the uh, the postcards, yeah. I, I when somebody writes me back, I mean, there are some guests I've I've you know pod guests I've built relationships with and become friends with, and like sometimes our cards will cross paths. You know, one will they'll, they'll, they'll cross before the other one has read theirs, um, and it's just this sense of like, wow, I've got pen pals in in the instantaneous age. Yeah, I've got people who are just you know. Hey, why don't I, I write Gil a postcard back instead of, you know, emailing or texting or whatever? Um, I so, yeah, a, we are throwbacks, I, I had guess. A, we <laughs> are. And I had a, actually the woman I bought the house from, the Berkshire house from, she, I never met her, but we ended up having a letter, a uh, pistolatory relationship for seven years. We would write letters to each other just about our lives. It was a beautiful, beautiful relation, relationship conducted solely by letter. And once she gave me her email and I was like, that ruins it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't want to email you and like get an email back. I went, I need this to like yeah. be drawn out over the course of like months. Like I want a letter a month. Like I want to respond to it. I, I don't want like an, a daily diary yeah. from this woman. Uh, so, it, yeah, you I know, have... it's a, it's a very special relationship and it can't be reproduced uh, by an email. Uh, bad news for you, man. You and I are going to start the uh, uh, a postcard correspondence. I after love this. it. I would love it. Please, finally, someone will send you one of the side Twombly ones. <laughs> I'll get your address after. But Christopher, thanks so much for for coming on the show again. This this book knocked me out in you know just well both in terms of you know plot and and the story that you're telling, but the environment you created and like we talked about earlier that sense of relationship and and what comes out of people when they're talking and not talking i think in the midst of 
a really engaging and thriller plot. You managed to do something really special with this. So thank you. Gil, thank you so much. It's been such an honor to be on the show. And I really appreciate it. And that was Christopher Ballin. His new book is The Lost Americans. It's out now from Harper. It is, it's a wonder. It's a really engrossing crime novel. Uh, strikes a wonderful balance between, between plot and, and the bigger world that the characters live in. And they're characters who you will, you'll feel a great deal for. I, I love this book. And I can see that I will now go back and read Christopher's two previous novels, A Beautiful Crime and The Destroyers. Um, we're also looking to meet up next week. He's doing a reading and signing in New York City on the 20th of March, 2023, for you time travelers out there. Uh, I'll be in the city anyway, so I'm hoping to get together with him and uh, thank him again for the book. So you should check out his site, ChristopherBallen.com, to find out more about his work. Behind, uh, beyond the, the novels, there's a lot on the site of his journalism, uh, interviews, essays. Um, there's a lot of stuff there, and it's really a joy to read when you see the, the body of work this guy's put together over the decades. You should also follow Christopher on Twitter at ChristoBallen, which is C-H-R-I-S-T-O-B-O-L-L-E-N. And on Instagram at Chris Ballen, which is uh, spelled the same, but without that O in the middle. There'll be links to all of this in the show and episode notes for this one. They can support the virtual memory show by telling other people about it. Let them know there's this podcast that comes out every week with really interesting conversations with fascinating creative folks. You can also uh, help out the show by telling me what you like and don't like about it and who you'd like to hear me record with or what movie or TV show or book or piece of music or theater or art exhibition or whatever you think I should turn listeners on to. And you can do that by sending me postcards, letters, emails, DMs, comments on my Substack, which is vmspod.substack.com, or by leaving a message on my Google voice number, which is 973 Eight six nine nine six five nine. That goes directly to voicemail, so you don't have to worry about getting stuck in an awkward conversation with me. And messages can be up to three minutes long. So if you go longer than that and get cut off, just call back and leave a second message. And let me know if it would be okay to include your message in an upcoming episode of the show. You might have something interesting to share with the listeners, but I would never put something like that in without the speaker's permission. So let me know. If you've got money to spare... Don't give it to me. I'm, you know, I've got a day job, treats me pretty well, and uh, my expenses for the show really are kind of minimal. Um, so I'd rather that you gave money to individuals or institutions in need. You can find people through GoFundMe, Patreon, Kickstarter, Crowdfunder, Indiegogo, and platforms like that, where there are people who need funding for, for medical bills, for rent, for getting artistic projects off the ground, and, and all sorts of other needs. If you're looking for somewhere to start with institutions or foundations, you can look to your local food bank. I give to mine every month. Then there's the Poor People's Campaign, Freedom Funds. Uh, I make targeted election contributions, but I'm also a lobbyist by day, so that's sort of part of my job. Um, but there are other things you can do. There's uh, Women's Choice, Plant Parenthood Funds. There are a lot of things that I think you can help do to, or you can do to, to try to help build a better world. So um, I hope you will. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth. Use with permission from the artist. You should visit my archives to check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 and learn more about his art and painting. And you can listen to his music at soundcloud.com slash Mayforth. And that's M-A-Y, the number four, T-H. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with another great conversation. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memories Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, Spotify, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. 
And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals, talk it up on social media, and go to iTunes, look up The Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It all goes to helping us build a bigger audience. You've been listening to The Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading, keep making art, and keep the conversation going. Thank you.